Hello, everyone, again, and welcome to the first EpiWin webinar of 2024. Once again, apologies for the delay as we had some tech problems, uh, but we'd like to warmly welcome you to this EpiWin webinar on the WHO update on COVID-19. We have four WHO experts here and two in the background as well to answer your questions and let you know about the latest information. I'd like to introduce you to our expert panel. We have Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, who is no stranger to you at all. She's uh, acting director for the Department of Epidemic and Pandemic. Yes. We now have yes, Vicky Hosea, who is our risk communication and communication uh, in a community engagement officer. And we have Ms. Shagun Kare. We also have... James Otian, who will answer some of your questions. Uh, without further... Um, so Priya and happy 2024 to all of you. Thanks very much for giving us an opportunity to give you an update on COVID-19. I'm going to give a few slides, um, skip a bit of a welcome because we're running a little late. I'm going to go through some slides with you to give you some context of where we are with COVID-19, um, actually in the context of many circulating respiratory pathogens, um, and see where we're going with this and what WHO is doing to support you, to support member states, to keep you and your loved ones safe. And then we will take some questions. Shagun's gonna uh, help us navigate those questions. So please use the Q&A box um, in the webinar. So with that, um, we need to put this in context. So the first slide that I'm showing um, is showing that SARS-CoV-2, influenza, RSV are co-circulating widely. The first key message that we have here is COVID-19 has not gone away. Um, we are tracking this virus around the world and we're taking measurements in terms of how much is in circulation in each country. One of the ways in which we're doing this is from our Sentinel surveillance sites and the percent positivity. Around the world, we have um, around 10% of samples that are collected through our Sentinel-based system are SARS-CoV-2. We do see some decreasing trends in Europe and increasing trends in the Americas, and it's stable in Africa and in Wipro. But from our non-Sentinel sites, it's around 35%. That's a lot of statistics to say that this virus is still circulating. Um, we don't have great visibility on how many infections and reinfections are happening right now um, from, because reporting systems have changed worldwide. But we did want to highlight that within just the first three weeks of 2024, there have been more than 400,000 cases reported to WHO from the countries that are still reporting to us. And unfortunately, in that same time period, we've had more than 7,000, almost 8,000 deaths. So we feel that there's a lot that we can do to prevent those deaths from happening. We're also tracking the impact of COVID-19. Um, and in the last uh, month, in the last 28 days, we've had more than 171,000 hospitalizations from COVID, and we've had more than 2,000 ICU admissions. Now, the data that we have on hospitalizations and ICU is really low. Um, in terms of the numbers of countries that are reporting this to us. So all of the information that we have on circulation and impact right now needs to be interpreted with some caution because we don't have great visibility around the world. One of the things that um, helps us to better track this virus around the world is wastewater surveillance. You've heard, I'm sure, quite a lot about this. I won't go into a lot of detail, but we are looking at wastewater surveillance in a number of countries around the world that help us understand how much of this virus is actually circulating. It gives us about a two to three week uh, uh, time frame in terms of giving us a clue of whether or not we may see some increased hospitalizations. And that's really helpful. That lead time is really helpful uh, to put hospitals um, in a better position to care for patients. These are just some examples from some countries. Um, they're selected uh, at random. I didn't pick these and the team didn't pick these um, intentionally, but just to show you within Europe, but also in South, um, in the Southern Hemisphere, New Zealand as an example, and in the US, in many countries, our wastewater systems are showing us that we may have passed a peak of SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV um, circulation worldwide. It doesn't mean that we're out of the woods, but it helps us sort of track the trends around the world. Let's put this in context. This is a figure that's looking at the evolution and the circulation of variants since the beginning of this pandemic, since 2020. It's a very colorful graph 
to remind us that the virus has and will continue to evolve. If we take a closer look in recent weeks, our JN.1 um, and its descendant lineages are the most reported SARS-CoV-2 variant in circulation. This is the variant of interest, is a sublineage of one of the BA.2.86 sublineages. I know that these numbers can become complicated and it's a lot to take in. But right now, JN.1 is around 79, 79% of the sequences that are shared globally. And that's quite important for us to understand because not only are we looking at the sequences, but we have our technical advisory group for virus evolution that is looking at the characteristics of the virus itself, this variant itself, in terms of severity, in terms of increased transmission, in terms of the use and the continued um, use of our diagnostics, our therapeutics, and our vaccines. Um, and so JN.1 is increasing and it is dominant worldwide, and we expect that trend to continue in the next coming weeks. This is a very busy slide, but we just wanted to highlight, and I won't go into detail, but our technical advisory group for virus evolution, TAG VE, continues to do risk evaluations. This is where we as WHO consolidate the world's expertise and all of the data that we have, looking at growth advantage, looking at immune escape, looking at severity, um, and making a risk assessment. Um, I, we can say that from all the data that we uh, have been able to access and analyze, we don't see a change in severity of JN.1 compared to the other Omicron sublineages that have been in circulation for more than two years now. That's important. However, please remember that this virus and all of its variants can cause the full spectrum of disease, everything from asymptomatic infection all the way to severe disease and death. Um, and your risk of developing severe disease, if you're not vaccinated in particular, but if you're of older age, have underlying conditions, you are at an increased risk of developing severe disease. Um, this is a slide that's looking at over time, uh, particularly in the last year. Our variant circulation globally is not the same by region. So while we are seeing JN.1 take over in terms of becoming the dominant variant worldwide, the way in which that has happened in different regions of the world varies because it depends on the waves of infection that have happened, whether it was beta or delta or BA.1 or BA.5 or XBB. It's quite complicated for us to track around the world um, the different levels of circulation, but also the population level immunity around the world. We are um, taking some steps to formalize the way in which we track this. We have a new lab network called COVINET, um, which is formalizing our ability to do these risk assessments for coronaviruses around the world and to help advise us and you on what you need to do to keep yourself safe. We also have other advisory groups. So this is just a slide um, to let you know, uh, if you aren't, if you don't know already, that we have an additional advisory group called TAG-COVAC, which is our technical advisory group for COVID-19 vaccine composition, which is monitoring this data as well and making, uh, giving WHO advice on if the vaccines, vaccines need to be updated. Um, and so they meet periodically and they will continue to do so as this virus continues to circulate and evolve. And the important message here is that the vaccines that are in use, even those based on the ancestral strain up to the latest ones, which are the XBB monovalent vaccines, continue to provide protection against severe disease and death. And I'll come to this in a moment. They also provide protection against developing post-COVID condition as well. So when it is your turn, please get vaccinated and get that additional dose. Here's just a few slides on vaccine uptake. Over time, um, vaccine use since 2021, um, up to recent months, more than 13 billion doses of vaccines have been administered. So many lives have been saved because of COVID-19 vaccines in every country of the world. We still continue to fight for increased access and use of these vaccines in all countries, particularly focusing on those who are most at risk for severe disease. And while we are seeing declining demand, I do want to take a moment to say that there has been overwhelming demand for vaccines over the course of this pandemic. So many people have come forward to receive the vaccine. We feel very strongly that that access still needs to be maintained in all countries, especially for those who are at risk. And we are working very hard to address any questions people have on the vaccines, any misinformation, disinformation about this, so that you have the right information to keep you and your loved ones safe. We are focusing uh, our work in country on the at-risk groups. So those who are older adults, people over 60, over 70, over 80 years old, people with underlying conditions, um, because there is varying levels of 
uh, coverage in this risk group around the world. Um, only 4% of people, older adults in low income countries, for example, have had a booster dose. And this is something that can be addressed and can improve. In terms of our healthcare workers, only 8% of health workers in low income countries have received a booster dose. So for us, it's really important that we continue to focus on the access and make sure that people have access to life saving vaccines. We do have the important disparities between the income groups and the regions. And again, this is something that we're working on with our partners around the world. Um, while we have seen an increase in uptake in every region, we still see disparity between high income countries and low income countries. And this is something that we continue to work on. Just a moment to speak about post COVID-19 condition. And uh, Dr. Jenna Diaz is here and she's gonna speak about this a little bit more later. We do, there's a lot of questions that we receive on post COVID condition. What you have on the left hand side there is looking at the incidence of post COVID condition. Now, it's very difficult for us globally to estimate how many people are suffering from post COVID condition for a number of reasons. One is because we're not all using the same case definition of what it actually means. Some people say long COVID um, and that's a broader definition of this. We have published some case definitions for adults mm -hmm. and for children and we're asking for clinicians to use these case definitions around the world. We want you to know that this is real, that this is something that needs to be studied. This is something that needs to be addressed in terms of providing treatment, providing prevention, but also providing treatment because we know many of you are suffering from post COVID condition around the world. Current estimates suggest that 6.2% of symptomatic individuals, people with COVID having uh, symptoms have developed or will develop post COVID condition with many types of systems affecting many organ systems. The mean durations of those symptoms is around nine months for people who are hospitalized, four months for people who have not been hospitalized, but about 15% had persistent symptoms after 12 months. So this is something WHO takes very seriously. We have been working on this with many partners around the world, focusing on making sure we have good guidelines, um, which are evaluated in a robust manner. Uh, we are collaborating on evidence synthesis from around the world, making sure that the studies that are done and we are advocating for more research to be done in this space um, to be able to consolidate that evidence and to provide um, treatment options um, and therapeutic guidelines, advice for clinicians and for people who are suffering from post COVID condition. This is just quickly to, to show a study looking at risk groups, high, those who are at a higher risk for developing post COVID condition um, enlisted here. Um, we can make all of these slides available, and I know we will make these slides available to you um, through the EpiWin platform. One thing I would like to highlight as well, different from post-COVID condition, is we still don't know everything about this virus as it continues to circulate. And one of the things we are looking at is the impact and the complications from repeat infections. So we want to be able to study um, the risk and the burden of people who are infected on different organ systems looking at pulmonary function, um, uh, um, neurologic function, cardiovascular function over time. So this is something that we have to continue to monitor because the virus has been in circulation for four years and I know it feels like it's a lot longer than that, but there is still so much to learn um, from all of us. And we're so grateful for all of our partners around the world who continue to work on this. So what can we do about this? And why do we continue to talk about COVID-19? First of all, we feel very strongly that there's more that we can do to prevent infections. We can't prevent all infections because this virus is in circulation in all countries, but there's a lot that we can do to keep ourselves safe and from passing the virus to someone else. And Vicki is here, she'll talk a little bit more about this as well. We feel there's a lot that we can do to prevent the spread of this virus. We're, not, we're talking about living our lives and getting out there and having societies open, but taking some precautions to prevent the spread because COVID-19 is still a global threat and it still poses a risk, particularly to those who are of older age and have underlying conditions. We feel there's more we can do to prevent severe disease. There are treatment options. So early diagnosis, earlier treatment, getting into the clinical care pathway can and continues to prevent severe disease. If you get infected, we want everything to be done to prevent you needing hospitalization. If you are hospitalized to receive the best care that you can from incredible health workers around the world to prevent you from developing severe disease and dying. There's more we can do to prevent post COVID-19 condition. And there's a lot of research that's underway. Much more needs to be done to ensure that we prevent post COVID condition, but also provide care to those of you who are suffering from this. And we feel that we can prevent deaths. 
So we have a whole global program of work. We're working through our regions and our countries to address this across what we call the five C's, collaborative surveillance, community protection, safe and scalable care, access to countermeasures, and the coordination of all of this with our partners in country and across different sectors of government. So please remember, uh, COVID-19 is still around. We say, and we have been saying, know your risk, lower your risk. I think Vicky's going to address this a little bit in the Q&A, but there are many things that you can do to prevent the spread of this, to keep you and your loved ones safe. Some simple measures. Um, if you're sick, stay at home, but definitely seek care when necessary because there are treatments that can prevent that severe disease and death. Wear a mask in crowded spaces, especially in poorly ventilated spaces. We have a whole body of work where you're trying to improve ventilation in the places where we live, where we work, where we study, and a lot more emphasis needs to do to do that to handle pathogens that transmit through the air. We do advise to clean your hands regularly, not just for COVID-19, but for many of the pathogens that are in circulation. Cover your coughs and sneezes, get vaccinated when it's your turn, keep distance, keep your distance when possible. There are a lot of preventative measures that work for COVID, but also are beneficial for other respiratory diseases like flu, which are in circulation, and especially in the Northern Hemisphere, are quite strongly circulating right now. If you're in an at-risk group, if you are an older adult, please get vaccinated when, you're, when it's your turn, within six to 12 months. Um, and we are working with governments to ensure that those vaccines are still available. And the best way to prevent long COVID or post COVID condition is to take those preventative measures to prevent infection and reinfection in the first place. So we continue to face a lot of challenges as we um, are addressing COVID in the context of many other infectious diseases, but also in the emergencies that many countries are facing, including war and displaced persons and floods and earthquakes. I won't go through all of this, but this is these items here are a major area of work for us right now as an organization. The work on COVID is preparedness for the future. So responding to COVID is putting us in a better situation to deal with many infectious threats that every country is facing right now. So my last two slides, because I know we're running a little bit late. We have messages for governments um, mm -hmm. where we are working with all of our member states around the world what we want to do is sustain the gains that have been made across different systems for COVID-19 to tackle the current threats and to face future threats. We want to all governments, all countries to continue to work towards ensuring equitable access to safe, effective and quality assured medical countermeasures for COVID-19 and other respiratory pathogens, including diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. We want to see strengthened efforts to implement an increased demand for available safe and effective vaccines for COVID, also for flu and RSV where appropriate, and in the right populations according to our recommendations. We want to reinforce the need for comprehensive and collaborative surveillance for COVID and other respiratory diseases so that we can understand its circulation, we can do risk assessments, and we can advise on what needs to be adjusted based on the virus that continues to circulate and evolve. And it's really important for governments to continue to report this information for us. We wanna ensure optimal clinical care through clear pathways for COVID-19 and respiratory diseases and integrate this into health services, including providing access to proven treatments and measures for our health workers and caregivers around the world. And we need to have good information. We need to have implement strong risk community and community engagement based on evidence-based and actionable interventions where we work with communities, where we develop them with communities, we implement them with communities so that they know what they can do to keep them, their communities uh, safe and, and, and prosperous. And our key messages, this is my last slide here. So although we're not in a crisis, although we're not in an emergency anymore, we are not seeing the same levels of impact that we saw in 2020, 2021, 2022 and even 2023, um, COVID-19 is still a global threat and there's much more that we need to do. We see a reduced impact and we see that deaths are now consistently, monthly death, weekly deaths are below 4,000, um, which is really important. However, any death that we can prevent, we still want to work incredibly hard to do that. And within the first three weeks of this year, we've had almost 8,000 deaths. In the last month alone, almost 12,000 deaths. And these, many of these can be prevented, and that's what we need to work on. 
We have very limited data on hospitalizations, and this makes us it very hard for us to, to assess the impact globally and draw strong conclusions from the trends that we're seeing. And COVID is not the only pathogen that's out there. So the burden on healthcare systems, COVID and flu and RSV and rhinovirus and mycoplasma pneumonia, all of that is causing burden in the healthcare system. So where we can prevent those infections, we want to be able to do so around the world. And the virus continues to evolve. We don't have a seasonal or a predictable pattern yet. And this is really important. Yeah. Um, and so we have we need to have good surveillance around the world to help us make these adjustments and assessments as necessary and when necessary. And while we are we do have reduced surveillance, the virus is infecting, it's reinfecting, it's killing, it's causing suffering from acute disease, from mm -hmm. post-COVID condition, and we don't know the longer-term impacts in the different organ systems on the repeat infections. And despite reduced demand and continued lack of access for life-saving tools, current countermeasures are working well for detection, for treatment, for vaccination, including against JN.1. Um, and we know that these are really, really important as there is a risk of emergence of new variants as this virus continues to circulate. So we need strength and surveillance um, around the world and sequencing, um, which is available around the world and shared with WHO, remains critical for us to continue to monitor this. So I'm sorry, there was a bit of a whirlwind mm -hmm. and probably too much information, mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the current things that we are looking at. Um, each area of work, um, there's a huge number of people around the world that continue to work on this. This is a virus that we um, uh, have not forgotten about. You may not hear it in the news. We have not forgotten about this. We continue to work on this every day. It remains a key priority for us. We are still in a pandemic. And even if the impact is reduced, there still is a global threat. So maybe back to you, Shagun. Thank you for that message. COVID-19 is definitely very much around and our response is preparing us for the future. We can actually see that from your response to the Slido. screen here and show you what you responded to. So 39% of you have been infected with COVID-19, either you or your immediate family. So that's a large chunk. Oh. Um, and that just shows what Maria said. So we have now our experts answering a few questions with uh, Shagun Kare as moderator. Over to you, Shagun. Thanks, Supriya. Um, I, I'd like to introduce myself very quickly. I'm a communications officer at WHO and I work specifically on health emergencies. And like many people on the panel today, I have lived COVID-19, breathed COVID-19 over many days and nights. So it's my, um, it's even more of a pleasure to be moderating this discussion today. Uh, I'll quickly introduce the guests, uh, the panelists that we have. Uh, online, we have Dr. Lorenzo Subisi, who's a virologist and an expert on coronaviruses. He's going to answer our questions on variants and what's coming next. Uh, he, next to me is Dr. Janet Diaz, uh, who leads WHO's work mm -hmm. on clinical management of he in health emergencies. So that includes COVID-19. Um, she and her team work tirelessly to make sure that people in outbreaks have access to the best treatment wherever in the world they are. Um, so that's a, a big task and a very capable person to lead that task. And uh, right at the end of the table, we have Vicky Houssier, who leads another very important part of our work, which is risk communication and community engagement. Uh, so what Vicky does is understand what communities are asking, what they need, the kind of advice they need, and make sure it reaches them in the best way, the most accessible way possible. So thank you, Vicky. Um, I'll be posing, just to kickstart the question and answer session, I'll be posing a question to each of our panelists. Maria, you've already heard from, but she's here too, to answer the questions. And then we'll open it up to the questions that I see you've already been uh, putting into the chat, to the Q&A box. Online, we also have uh, Dr. Dr. Jamie Rylance, who's a clinical management expert as well, and Dr. Jamie, uh, James, sorry, Jamie and James. Uh, Jamie Rylance and James Otieno, who's a bioinformatician and a genomic epidemiologist. 
to answer questions. So we have quite a number of experts um, and please do send in your questions. So I'm going to turn to Lorenzo first, who's joining us online to ask about this latest variant JN.1. How widespread is it? And do we have a sense of what's coming after? Over to Lorenzo. Thank you, Shagun. Can you hear me? Yes, I think you, you can all hear me. So um, yeah, I think uh, in terms of uh, GN1, uh, uh, Maria has presented the data. So we are talking about uh, a variant that is now uh, um, dominant globally with uh, representing over uh, almost 80% of the sequence that are shared globally. Uh, and uh, it's actually dominant in all WHO regions. So all WHO regions are seeing the uh, GN1 uh, um, spread in in, um, in their countries. Uh, and I'd like to also stress that actually since Omicron, uh, no uh, variant has, uh, um, has met the updated um, definition for variant of concern, which is the highest level of uh, uh, risk uh, uh, that WHO uses. So GN1 is a, is actually a variant of interest um, and uh, WHO regularly published uh, a risk evaluation in collaboration with the Technical Advisory Group on Virus Evolution, uh, risk evaluation for uh, variants of interest. So um, we have uh, a GN1 risk evaluation and uh, currently the risk is assessed as low. Um, as there is no indication that this variant uh, uh, is associated with the uh, um, increased severity as compared to other SARS-CoV-2 variants. As Maria mentioned, uh, there are a number of countries that have recently experienced uh, increase in uh, hospitalizations or other severity indicator, and that was not associated to um, a specific SARS-CoV-2 variants, but rather um, to the co-circulation of uh, uh, a number of respiratory viruses. So I think when it comes to the question on what is next, uh, that's a, a very important question. And uh, obviously we have collected uh, uh, data over four years. However, we cannot say that we can predict SARS-CoV-2 evolution. So the evolution of the virus remains unpredictable. Uh, what we can do is uh, uh, use the data that we have been collecting to inform uh, planning, uh, uh, to inform planning and future scenarios. Uh, and I think in that regard, uh, Maria mentioned that we have established in WHO uh, coronavirus network, uh, was one of the focus uh, is going to be um, to have a, a coordinated response uh, for a timely risk assessment of emerging coronaviruses, including SARS-CoV-2 variants. And, uh, and uh, that network is currently, um, uh, it's currently formed by uh, uh, 20 labs from all over um, all over the, the globe. And uh, I think one of the main uh, um, objectives is going to be also making sure that we don't uh, have blind spots in terms of uh, uh, genomic surveillance, uh, uh, because those blind spots can potentially uh, lead to undetected virus circulation and then, um, you know, um, give rise to um, new variants uh, we, whose profile, biological profile, we, we don't know, and they could be more severe. Um, so I think uh, that that is uh, that is on the WHO side what we are currently doing to to keep tracking SARS-CoV-2 variants. Over to you, Shagun. Uh, I believe Supriya has something to share with us before we move on to the next question. Hi, everyone. Before we go on to the next question, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Please go to the slider once again, type in the slido number, and tell us what you are doing to protect yourself from COVID-19 these days. I'm just putting this on the screen for a couple of minutes for the QR code. I'll also put the link on the chat, so you can get it from the chat and respond while the discussion is going on. Thanks, Supriya. Participation on Slido makes it a lot more interactive and also gives us a sense of uh, where you all are at uh, when it comes to COVID-19. Like I said, we're 
all the time in it, but it's nice to get some perspective from outside. Um, so I'll, I'll turn to Janet next uh, with a question. Uh, Janet, you cover um, both clinical management, treatment of COVID-19, but also post-COVID condition, or what's broadly known as long COVID condition, long COVID, sorry. Um, so the question to you is more on the latter, to give you some time to respond. On long COVID, where are we in our understanding of the condition and what is WHO doing? Sure, thanks Shagun and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening colleagues that are on call. Uh, um, it's an important question. So where are we now? I think uh, we continue to describe long COVID and post COVID-19 condition as a syndromic uh, diagnosis. Uh, so we don't have a, you know, a specific diagnostic test for it. Uh, the syndrome, so it's like a group of symptoms that continue to be the most um, common symptoms that patients do report, combination of shortness of breath, cognitive dysfunction and fatigue, though, um, you know, many, many symptoms have been described, probably around 100 symptoms have been described in, in patients with uh, post-COVID uh, condition. So it is a multi-system uh, uh, disease affecting different organs, as you can understand from the symptoms that are being experienced by people. What do we know about the pathogenesis or the mechanism of disease? And this is really important, the work that's being done by scientists to understand really what is the the what is causing the symptoms and the complications so there's we still don't have the full picture so you know evidence is emerging and there's a lot of work being done in this space but uh, abnormalities have been described in the immune system so dysregulated immune system or autoimmunity abnormalities have been described in the coagulation system so that means the clotting symptoms are in little clots in different vessels abnormalities in the brain and the signaling in the brain and also abnormalities in the microbiome so, so uh, there is evolving uh, uh, descriptions of changes being seen um, in the body in patients who have post COVID-19 condition, but putting this all together still is a piece of work to be done. Uh, we still see um, uh, post COVID-19 conditioning happening more in women than in men. Uh, in adults more than in children. It's, it's, it's uncommon in children. Uh, and people who have comorbid conditions or chronic diseases more than those that don't. And also more in those that had severe disease or who were hospitalized um, with severe disease uh, than those that were not hospitalized. But, that, but people who are non hospitalized, just to be clear, they could also mm -hmm. develop post COVID 19 condition. It's just more common in those that were hospitalized. The last estimates we have about how many people are getting uh, develop, going on to develop post COVID 19 condition or long COVID is an old estimate. Uh, so this really needs to be updated. And I know colleagues are working on this, but the estimate is about 6%. And that was in the pre Omicron era would go on to develop. Um, but the, you know, the reports vary in different parts of the world. Um, so in regards to treatment, uh, which probably is, is, is what people want to know. We still uh, don't have a specific treatment for post COVID-19 condition. Uh, we don't know prevention is key. So the messages that Maria shared already on prevention from getting infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, prevention with vaccination uh, reduces uh, the incidence of developing post COVID-19 condition. And uh, right now the standard of care is getting care is getting care through a multidisciplinary approach, meaning that uh, you go to your doctor, you get a solid evaluation. Uh, if you need to see a specialist uh, for concerns of a neurological uh, complication or cardiovascular or pulmonary complication that should be coordinated centrally by your general uh, practitioner, um, symptomatic management, uh, rehab intervention, Interventions and then medicines. We don't have a proven therapy yet for post COVID 19 condition, but there are lots and lots of clinical trials ongoing looking at different types of medicines that may be potential therapeutic uh, options. Those range. Uh, some of them are testing immunomodulators, others are testing antivirals, others are testing um, metabolic drugs like metformin that is used for diabetes, others uh, are testing uh, dietary supplements. Uh, so there is, um, and also testing more, examining more interventions in, in the rehab field. So, so there's a, a lots going on. Um, so what is WHO doing, uh, which I think is really important. So we had already published the definition uh, for post COVID-19 condition long COVID in adults and in children. That was really important to standardize how patients get diagnosed and how you enroll into clinical trials. Um, we are trying to ensure that that 
definition is still valid, so it, but it is still valid to date. Um, we also worked with collaborators, so we have a nice group of international collaborators around the world on core outcome sets. Core outcome sets are really also important uh, to standardize endpoints in clinical trials so that when these trials start to report their endpoints, we have a, a core set of endpoints that we could then merge together, synthesize the evidence uh, in order to make recommendations. Um, so, so that's a, a piece of work that we've been working on with our uh, great collaborators. Uh, in addition, uh, we host a uh, research working group uh, every month uh, where we invite researchers to come present their uh, research trials, their studies, uh, preliminary results, um, so that we can kind of uh, share amongst peers uh, knowledge um, in the field and grow collaborations amongst different investigators so that we can accelerate the learnings um, in the space. Uh, our colleagues in PAHO have uh, published on their website a landscape of potential treatments uh, following what's being studied. Uh, we also have a webinar series on post-COVID-19 condition with partners, uh, and that happens um, on a regular basis. And uh, importantly, we are, and again, again with, with the great global collaborators we have around the world, in a collaboration to develop post-COVID-19 clinical uh, guidelines. And one of the most important parts of that is monitoring the evidence. So because there's so much trials going on and studies being published, we now have a system in place to monitor the evidence so that we know when to uh, look at the evidence more closely, synthesize it, and then write recommendations. And we'll be looking abroad across all the spectrum of interventions that are already described uh, to see how we update our clinical guidelines on uh, the clinical management treatments for um, long COVID. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot of uh, work summarized right there. Uh, Janet, before I move on to Vicky, just one question. What do we know about recovery? Do patients recover from this condition? How long does it take? So it's a, it's a great question. Again, the the data we have um, is uh, is uh, our estimates. Um, and again, there's variation in this, but on you know from previous estimates, if you uh, were someone who was not hospitalized, so not hospitalized, um, but uh, had COVID um, as an outpatient and developed post-COVID condition, the mean duration is about four months. Um, so, so uh, you know, significant, uh, but uh, the mean duration um, about four months. If you were hospitalized with post-COVID, um, with COVID and then went on to develop post-COVID-19 condition, then uh, the mean duration is more around nine months. And then, so that's, you know, significant, you know, longer. And then we know that there is a proportion of patients that don't fully uh, recover. Um, uh, so so a, a smaller proportion, um, but I think all this still really needs to be better. Uh, as we need better estimates, more robust uh, studies uh, to get these um, most accurate numbers. I would say what's also concerning is that we know from one important study that was done in the US, uh, that looked at mortality and cardiovascular complications in the year after um, having had uh, COVID. And they did see a higher level of um, higher risk of death uh, in the cohort uh, when they compared it to an uninfected group. So the risk of cardiovascular complications is concerning and some of those complications lasting, some of those at risk lasting um, up to two years after the first infection uh, for uh, patients who were hospitalized. So, so, so when you're caring, you know, as a patient who's gone through COVID, if you have post-COVID-19 condition and as a health worker, if you're caring for these patients, it's important just to know this, that this is something you have to follow up, monitor, ask the right questions during your clinical exam um, and uh, do the right evaluations. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Um, yeah, I think five years on, we're still continuing to learn and uh, the importance of some of these longer term consequences, not just not just long COVID, though long COVID is terrible, um, but all the other complications is uh, we're, we're getting a better idea. Um, very important research going on out there. Um, I'll, I'll turn to Vicky. Um, and ask a question, but first we'd like to see what you said on the Slido poll on what measures you're taking to protect yourself from COVID-19. Oh, it's a word cloud. So I see nothing is the number one answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some people are wearing a mask. Uh, So what are you doing to protect yourself from COVID-19 these days? So what I hope you can see that also um, 
wearing a mask, hand washing, uh, avoiding close contact, taking precautions. Yeah, vaccine. Uh, vaccine so, a lot of time. So great. So this is great. To you is, does this align with what WHO recommends? What is our advice on how you can protect yourself? No, it sounds great. I mean, it's really great to see uh, that the participants are still uh, implementing all those uh, productive measures. It's uh, really important. Uh, and especially when we've been hearing from the update and our expert today um, about how COVID is still around, not just COVID, but also other viruses, uh, flu and other respiratory viruses. Uh, viruses. So it's really important for people to know their risk and knowing that there is a still a high circulation of virus is a risk. So this is where it's really important for you to be aware of the risk that there's a lot of COVID still going around and to know what you can do to lower your risk. Um, and from this one, what we can see that uh, a lot of you are doing this is using using these productive measures to protect yourself and protect others. Um, so one of them, um, maybe I didn't see on the screen, is like, uh, if you feel unwell, if you feel sick, stay home. Um, so don't spread the virus, but also uh, recover yourself. Uh, one thing we want to make sure, like if the symptoms get worse, I mean, really get into contact with your health workers. Uh, the other one that we've seen quite a lot is wear a mask when you go to crowded place or to poorly ventilate, ventilated place. Um, one thing that was mentioned too, which is really important, is clean your hands regularly. Uh, the other one cover your cough and your sneeze. This is really important again, so that you know you don't spread the virus. Keep a distance as uh, feasible. And also check, check your status for a vaccine. And if available to you, get your vaccine. We know that all those protective measures, they work. Um, they not only work for COVID, they work for flu and for other respiratory disease. Um, one thing that's really important also that uh, Maria mentioned, but I really would like to um, uh, repeat is also how to protect the people who are most at risk. So as we said, protective measures and vaccine are really crucial uh, to avoid really the serious consequences for uh, people getting, uh, you know, this uh, virus. Um, we know that vaccine works. We know that protective measures work, not only for COVID, but also for other viruses. So um, it's great that, to see that you are all continuing to implement those protective measures. Um, I was really surprised also by the number that we saw of people that have been infected in those last uh, six months. So you were saying like 39%. So this is really uh, important to emphasize the role of the protective measures. So continue to do that, remember. Thanks, Agun. Thank you, Vicky. Um, I know we're running over time. Thank you so much for your patience with the technical difficulties that we had. We'll try and catch up, but I think we will be running over time. So maybe if you, if you need to leave right now, you could catch up with the recording, uh, which will be available. Um, so there's a number of questions on long COVID, and I think Janet covered quite a bit of it, but maybe I'll, I'll pose a question to Maria on what we're doing with member states on this matter. How, how do we emphasize the importance of this condition and what needs to be done? Uh, for post-COVID conditions yeah. long COVID? Well, I mean, Janet pointed out a number of different ways in which we are trying to engage research communities around the world um, to be able to have better evidence, to have better treatments and better options for people who are suffering, but also to prevent uh, long COVID. Member states can help in a number of ways. One is to provide care. Uh, for patients when they enter the clinical care pathway. And Janet, you probably want to comment on this, but we need to ensure that patients, wherever they show up in the healthcare system, receive appropriate care. And for post-COVID condition, we know that this affects many organs of the body. And so, as Janet pointed out, we, they, there needs to be a comprehensive assessment and approach to the treatment. We're also advocating for funding to be provided for research, and member states can help in this way um, because you can't do research in a vacuum we don't want research to only take place in high income countries. 
um, there's discussion and in some countries there are cohort studies that have been established to follow patients over time. That costs money and that requires investment and we feel it's really important that that investment is made because this condition is real. I hear a lot from people saying well nobody people don't believe me they don't believe that I'm suffering from this and we know that this is real so when we first started meeting with patient advocates they asked for recognition for research and for rehabilitation um, and we've taken that on board since early 2020. Um, to make sure that that we are focusing on this. And you heard Janet's comprehensive um, you know, response on what we're doing, so it is taken seriously. But I have to say, it, this is in the context of what we're asking member states to do for COVID. You know, it's keeping up your surveillance system so we understand the circulation, we understand the virus evolution, because as the virus continues to infect people, there is the risk of post-COVID condition. We're asking for countries to keep up good clinical care to ensure that vaccines are provided to those who, who need them. We've heard again, vaccinations prevent or reduce the risk of developing post-COVID condition. We wanna make sure that there's good diagnostics, uh, good access to life-saving tools. So across the work we do with member states is continued vigilance for COVID. It's continued vigilance across tracking, tracing, monitoring the impact, providing good care, access to countermeasures, and for us to work with the global community to have a stronger evidence base to update our advice. We're still learning. We will be learning about this virus for quite some time. Post-COVID condition is one of the ones that we have invested in, in terms of our times and the work that we have with member states, um, and that will continue uh, into the future. Yeah. I'll continue on this topic just for a second because we have a number of questions on it and one is I believe from a journalist asking about the number of people who've been infected or not infected who are affected by long COVID and, and you mentioned I believe 6% uh, of uh, COVID patients by WHO's definition go on to get long COVID but do you also have a sense of how many people might have died from this condition Janet? Thanks, uh, Shagun. I think just to, to answer your questions, and I had a couple of comments to Maria's. Uh, again, the estimates we have are from pre-Omicron um, estimates about the, you know, how, what proportion of patients who had COVID-19 go on to develop uh, post-COVID-19 condition, and that was, um, you know, an estimate of about 6%. But those, that number really needs to be um, uh, re-looked at uh, with uh, more information of the Omicron error, and uh, we will be working with our, our colleagues and collaborators uh, to do that uh, and get that for you. Uh, in regards to, to how many deaths, I, that number I don't have. Um, uh, I think it is complicated though. We would need, we, we do want this question to be answered uh, by the research community, uh, meaning that um, when people code deaths, uh, you know, how is it getting coded? Because um, it's the cause of death, the proximal, you know, the first cause of death, and then maybe it was associated then to post-COVID-19 condition, but was it a cause of death from a cardiovascular event, from a stroke, or another, you know, an acute respiratory event, um, you know, uh, then that would be coded, but will it also be coded as post-COVID-19 condition? I'm not sure. So I'm, I'm wondering, it may be may depend on how good the coding is done, but regardless, um, you know, this is, sounds like it's a, it's an important piece of um, data that we need to um, better understand, uh, data we need to make sure is, is well done. So the coding aspect, I think we always know how important it is for coding in order to understand uh, cause of death and then um, a better analysis on taking those coded numbers uh, to understand the burden of, um, of, of mortality from post COVID-19 condition. And then just a couple of things to add on to Maria's, I think uh, the clinical care, really access to care, access to primary care, access to rehabilitation care is really key. Um, and, and that's a general message, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, PHC, primary health care is, you know, a really important a part of that universal health coverage. So I think just we have to integrate COVID-19 into care, into the health system. We know there will be a significant uh, burden of patients, uh, people with, with living with uh, post-COVID-19 condition and the health system needs to uh, be ready and take care of these patients um, with a coordinated approach to access to specialty care, diagnostic tests, uh, and specialty care ranging between, uh, you know, uh, mental health providers, uh, cardi um, cardiologists, uh, specialists of the brain, um, social workers, uh, and those sorts. So it's a really a multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to care, for, especially for patients who've got a, a post-COVID condition that's, you know, that persists. Thank you.
Thanks, Janet. Um, Maria, we had a, pres a question from your presentation from Fabienne, who was asking about increasing trends of SARS-CoV-2 positivity. So how many tests for COVID-19 come back positive in the Americas? But m maybe we don't go too much into specifics, but can you tell us now that you know, we're living in a time when uh, data reporting is going down, how are we understanding the burden of COVID-19? So in terms of the percent positivity that we're looking at, we do this through our GISRA system. It's the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, which has expanded its scope to include SARS-CoV-2 and also RSV. And we're hoping to actually include MERS coronavirus in, in at-risk countries as well. And the percent positivity comes from the Sentinel-based systems. These are hospitals and, and dedicated areas in specific countries around the world that help us to track this from most more a representative sample from around the world and the trends fluctuate. So for um, SARS-CoV-2, it's around 10% globally, but it does vary greatly in different regions. Um, I, we can put the link in the, Supri, I'm looking at you, we can put the link in the, in the webinar or even later to show you where you can look by region, the different types of circulation. Within those maps, that, uh, in those graphs, it also shows influenza circulation as well, which is increasing um, in the Northern Hemisphere, around 20% or so. So some people may not know what they're infected with, which is why the clinical care and integrating clinical care is so, so critical that people get the care they need when they need it, get a good diagnosis, they get in the right, uh, get on the right treatment course. But surveillance, yes, is declining uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, when the emergency was lifted in May, uh, many countries are now integrating SARS-CoV-2 with influenza, and that's a good thing, um, but the reporting systems have changed. Not everybody gets tested and we don't need to test every single case except with the exception of getting into that clinical care pathway um, but we need to understand its circulation so we look at the gistra system um, which now includes SARS-CoV-2 we look at wastewater systems and wastewater um, indicates that actually the amount of circulation in country is anywhere from 2 to 19 times higher than is what's reported so the virus is circulating and it's quite intensively circulating around the world. We may not know if we've been infected because we have some immunity from, from vaccination or past infection. So we may not develop severe disease. Many people aren't testing as much anymore. Um, but again, lots of different systems will help us to track this wastewater surveillance, sentinel-based systems, um, testing different types of PCR-based testing around the world. There's event-based monitoring, which we still I have a large number of people that are looking at signals around the world and seeing, are we actually seeing an increase in hospitalization? Lorenzo mentioned this, you know, so many countries have in, reported an increase in hospitalizations. Was that do, due to a new variant or not? So there's a lot of different ways that we track this. We consolidate the information together. We discuss with our laboratory networks, our expert groups, and that's where you see some of those figures. We have a new dashboard that's up. Uh, and just to plug that, because we launched the new dashboard at the end of December, but you will see in the next couple of months, we're actually going to change the page where we have cases to say circulation. And what we will show there, what we want to demonstrate is that we're looking at not just the cases that are reported to us, but the wastewater systems, the percent positivity and the variant circulation. So you, if you want to know in your country, we only go at the, the national level and regional and global level, but you can see how we're trying to track this from the different systems. That's collaborative surveillance, that's comprehensive surveillance, and that needs to continue. We don't have good surveillance in animals, but that's a different story. Um, but it's multiple systems that we're utilizing right now. Thanks, Maria. Maybe we'll keep the animal stuff for another epi when that deserves its own hour. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion on vaccines, uh, boosters. So maybe between the two of you, Vicky or Maria, maybe somebody would like to talk about what WHO's recommendations currently are on vaccines. And there was a question on whether there's a maximum number of boosters a person can receive. Yeah. So we have, uh, we work with an advisory group called SAGE that makes recommendations on the policy for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, they meet regularly. Uh, they're going to meet again in the next couple of months. The way that we make recommendations for COVID-19 vaccine vaccination is by risk group. 
So we have the highest risk group. So these are people of older age. We say older age because countries define older age differently uh, in different countries, maybe 70 years old, over 70, over 80, even higher. Um, older people over 60 with underlying conditions. These are the highest risk individuals, immunocompromised individuals. And of course, we want to protect our health frontline workers. Depending on your risk group within that highest risk group, our recommendation is to receive an additional dose in the last six to 12 months. So the question of how many doses, it really depends on when was your last dose. So we know that there is strong protection against severe disease and death over many months, um, many months. But for the at-risk groups, we really want you to get, we're gonna move away from boosters because we're now in year five. So if you received a booster three years ago, that's actually not what we're after. What we really want is for you to get boosted within six to 12 months if you're in that highest risk group. And then we have recommendations for medium risk and lowest risk. Again, our recommendations for, are for the globe. So you may see some differences in national policies, but those are set for the populations of those nations. And that's you know the sovereign right of those nations, but we're focused on everyone around the world. Our focus is vaccination and a dose within the last six to 12 months for the highest risk group in every country. Easy for us to say, it's another thing to have access. So that's one of the things we're working on with member states, with manufacturers and making sure that there still is an increase in demand for these vaccines and that the vaccines get to the countries and get into the arms of the people who need them most. Sounds great. <laughs> um, what can we say? Maybe one other thing that we're doing, Maria, is to listening to people and communities and their questions. Mm -hmm. uh, people have questions about, you know, with the new variant, is the, the vaccine still working? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, people are asking, um, uh, is the vaccine safe mm -hmm. yes. yes because of how many vaccines were More like provided 13 billion yeah yeah um 13 billion doses were provided one thing also that was estimated i think from 2021 alone is that with the vaccine the COVID vaccine we had an estimated 14 million uh lives saved so yes vaccine works uh yes we know there's still a question especially when the virus is evolving we are answering also those questions through Q and A's through the press conference. We're working very closely with the countries uh, to try to make sure that we provide uh, adapted and suitable information. So we're working on that too. Thanks. Um, th thank you. So you just basically did my job, <laughs> <laughs> asking Sorry. and answering questions. Thank you, Vicky. Um, just to add that also we do look at adverse events if there are any Sorry. carefully and they are extremely rare with the COVID vaccine. Yeah. Um, so I think we're running out of time and um, we have a question which has been highlighted as a good one to end on. Uh, thank you to Lindsay who's collecting these questions and sharing them with me. Um, the pandemic highlighted inequalities in healthcare access and preparedness. How can we leverage the lessons learned to build more resilient and equitable health systems for the future. And how I'm gonna ask you to answer this is each of you give a very short answer. So what do we hope for the next, if, if slash when there's the next pandemic, what do we hope we've learned from um, COVID-19? Yeah, working closely with the communities, even closer, working closer with the people and co-developing solutions with them. Do I have to give only one? <laughs> Try. <laughs> I think the challenge for this is, is there's so many lessons that we are learning. We're still in this pandemic and it's not a, you know, a crisis or an emergency, but we want to sustain the gains across all of these different strengthened systems for surveillance, for clinical care, for access to countermeasures, et cetera. But it's beyond the health systems. We need strong political commitments to make sure that we do better the next time. It isn't a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And we have learned a lot and the trauma that we've gone through, and it is a trauma, needs to be for something. This is what the pandemic accord is being discussing right now with member states to make a political commitment. We also have to look at financing. So not just the health systems and the science and the strong collaborations there, but it's the political commitment. and It's the financial commitment that we go for. There's some really good things that are happening with pandemic funds and whatnot, but we can't continue to live in a cycle of panic and neglect. Um, and we are, I mean, no one wants to talk about COVID anymore. So it's important for us as an organization to remind people of this and that we have not stopped on this, but it's across many different 
elements that have to be addressed. It's hard and it's difficult and it's a long slog, but we're in it. Our member states are in it uh, and we will keep pushing until we see that these systems are maintained um, into the future. Okay, Joanna. Thanks. Um, I would focus on my line of work, uh, safe and scalable clinical care. It is part of the HEPR, the Health Emergency Preparedness and Resilience Strategy. Um, and what does that really mean? It means focusing on uh, systems, that the systems are in place to scale and to surge. Uh, if you're faced with, um, you know, a new threat, a new infectious disease, a new pandemic, and that those clinical pathways can be adaptable for, for whatever that pathogen is uh, and provide quality care. Um, the second is supplies. We learned from COVID about the lack of oxygen and then and, the, and that was, you know, a big problem all around uh, in many countries of the world. Uh, so we've been working really hard on improving the access to medical oxygen, but it's not just medical oxygen, it's oxygen, medical devices, other key supplies, treatments, you know, the medicines, once we had life-saving medicines, did they get to all the patients that needed them? So getting the medicines, the supplies, everything, the last mile to the patient and to the healthcare provider, to the facility, we learned we need to do that better. Uh, health workers, that health workers need to be skilled and trained uh, in the most up-to-date information on treatment, on clinical management, uh, and this is not just the clinicians, the doctors, the nurses, the other um, uh, therapists, it's also the technical staff. And again, I focus a little bit on oxygen because oxygen was such a key thing during COVID-19. It's the biomedical engineers, the clinical engineers, the technicians that actually work on oxygen production, uh, the generation of electricity at facilities that's um, uh, reliable, 24 hours a day, the access to safe water. So these are basic things, but we, we there, there were, you know, problems with this in COVID-19 that were glaring. And so equity to those interventions is really important. And um, um, so health workers. And then finally, the structures, the spaces that uh, care for patients, both in the community and in the health facilities, the hospitals, um, that those are, are fit for purpose, that you have enough um, uh, ward space, you have enough uh, bed space, uh, you have enough uh, when needed, you know, critical care areas to manage the critically ill, emergency areas to manage the patients that come into the emergency, um, so that these structures are safe places for healthcare workers uh, to work in and for patients to receive their care. So that's a uh, that's where I would end up, safe and scalable clinical care. Wow, Janet, <laughs> gives you, makes it feel like an iceberg. You know, we have the case numbers and the death numbers on top, and then there's everything that kind of goes behind, which we, I mean, people like me, we don't necessarily think about. So thank you uh, for referring to all those things that go into making a so solid response. Uh, this reminds me that uh, we're, at the four year anniversary of the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern, which is uh, WHO's highest level of alarm. It says something truly unprecedented and very important is happening in, in our world and we need to pay attention. Uh, COVID was declared as a public health emergency four years ago, uh, at four years and two days ago. Uh, so maybe Maria, since you've been the face of uh, a lot of this for WHO, just w w can you tell us, uh, our participants, what it felt like four years back? I mean, that's uh, difficult, right? It's, it's, we're year five of a pandemic. You know, we've been, like all of you, have been living this every single day. Um, it's been the most, I think for all of us, the most difficult, the most intense, um challenging time of our professional and i could say personal life um i think you know i'm i'm humbled by the the global coming together to address and tackle this one particular problem you know just listening to i know lorenzo had to, to hop off but lorenzo and janet and vicky and you and so many people that work here at who yes maybe you've seen my face a lot but the only reason way i was able to do my job because of people like you and the thousands of people who are around the world doing so much work in country you know i'm listening to janet talk and i'm like i mean it's just pretty incredible what the group has come together and i know every single one of us wish we were able to do more so there's a there's a sadness that i have when i think about it um there's a pride that i have in terms of the world coming together but i i just think of people who are out there suffering. I think of people who are out there who've lost loved ones and who continue to lose loved ones and what more we can do. Um, 
you know, that's what I think of every day. And I feel privileged to work here at WHO with incredible staff in all of our regional offices and our country offices and here in HQ. I'm grateful to all of the collaborators that continue to work with us every single day across the entire spectrum of not just COVID, but those of people who are working on COVID are, are also dealing with, they've dealt with MPOX, they deal with Ebola, they're dealing with war, they're dealing with floods. So it's been a very difficult four years. So I look back on it with, I remember it all. Um, I don't think I will ever be able to forget it, but just like you, um, we get up every day and we, and we just try to do more, but just know here at WHO, this is a priority for us. Um, there are many people that continue to work on COVID um, in the context of everything else that we face and we need your help. Um, you have a role to play to keep you and your loved ones safe. That was true on day one, it's true now. Um, and we want to ensure uh, that you stay alive. Your life is precious. Uh, everything that you have to do to contribute to, to this world, please be kind to one another. Um, four years for many of us have been difficult in that space as well. But um, thanks for asking the question. Uh, but it's another day at work and we will finish this webinar and go back to work. Um, but just lastly, to thank my family. Um, and I'm sure all of us want to thank our families for kind of supporting us through this because you know, we're human beings too. So thanks for thanks, the question. Maria. And I'm joined by many of our participants who are putting their thanks in the chat. Um, I guess to all of us, not, as you said, it, it's, a, it's a shared effort. Uh, I'll pass it back to Supriya for any final words. And from my side, thank you to the wonderful team in the studio who's uh, bringing this to you on your screens and uh, the interpreters who are bringing it to you in your ears, should you need it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, first of all, to the panelists and thanks to Shagun for moderating an excellent uh, Q&A session with some really important questions that are being answered. Uh, and a big hand, first of all, to the panelists. Also to the participants, we've got great uh, engagement today. Lots of views, lots of uh, comments. Uh, mostly positive and uh, constructive. So thank you to all of you who joined us. I'd also like to thank the WHO studio team here who's been working behind the scenes. Um, <clears throat> uh, Mark, Lindsay, Gilles, Alex, uh, to make this webinar possible. Our interpreters and our IT colleagues as well, who've helped us. And of course, uh, everyone, who's been involved, who's come over and engaged and set up the Everyone webinar. Uh, we will get back to you with more webinars and a list will be shared with you. If you want to be regularly updated, please do join our mailing list and a subscriber list, which is also in the chat. And um, see you next time. Thanks once again and goodbye. <laughs>